Okay, so sup, bubs? It's Kokodo, back with another Dope Talk short podcast for hosting people with dope talents. Today we've got internet horror enthusiast and scary boy, Nightmind. You want to introduce yourself, Nick? Sure thing. Hello, everybody. I am Nick Nocturne, host of Nightmind on YouTube, layer of all the creepy, sordid, dark, and mysterious things you can find on the internet, and a little bit offline as well. Cool. Um, so what would you kind of explain your content to be? Because I know it's like really, really niche and sort of like off in another universe on YouTube entirely. Because cause at least at least to me, like I would kind of start to explain it as creepypastas. But I know that's kind of understating what you do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely related to the field of creepypasta in a way, in the sense that it's dark and horrifying material put online and created by just your average person who wants to make something awesome and put it online. It took a little while to actually describe what I do for people or get a real term to nail it down, but I think immersive online storytelling is what really works as a general label. People want to tell stories and they want to do it online using all sorts of media formats, websites, programs, video, images, audio, what have you, in order to tell a story that's immersive. That usually includes the audience finding or discovering things as a participant of the story. Sometimes they're just an observer. Sometimes they are legitimately kind of a character. Other times the story depends completely on them helping out with things and moving it along. But it's all in a way sort of immersive. Trying to get into explaining what you do, or at least what a lot of the people that you uh, cover do, it's, it is very much a, a different sense of storytelling that's not easily um, transcended into just like visual medium or like video medium or even just like audio. It's like an ARG situation where you have just all sorts of different shit, including like forums and websites. And I guess that's why it, it takes hours or at least like a, the, the length of your videos to explain like what exactly goes into this. Oh, uh, really just going through the entire experience myself the best I can for gaining the perspective of somebody who were going through the story for the first time and being able to find all the pieces ready and waiting. Like you said, it's something where it does require multiple aspects for a character. The best way I can describe it for people as just a pure example, a real simple example of how this stuff usually goes is, let's say there's somebody experiencing a paranormal sort of problem in the real world. They're documenting it on their, say, iPhone or, you know, their basic home camera. They upload the footage to YouTube and they have an associated Twitter account to talk about things in live time. You know, speak to people who have seen the videos, acting as if they're a real person in the real world experiencing these things and keeping us updated in between videos on their movements, which is actually pretty much basically how Marble Hornets went, one of the huge classic web series in my field. But it's just like that, and you can go ahead and incorporate any other sort of aspect of stuff that you have online at your disposal to tell the story. And quite often, I do have to go through all the bits and odds and ends of what people have uh, used to tell their story in order to piece things together for an audience and provide a cohesive storytelling experience. That's, I think, the real benefit of why people come to me a lot, instead of going ahead and finding it on their own. Because so much of it is so incredibly scattered, and some of it's lost, like really hard to find stuff too, that it actually needs to be collected by somebody, put together, and then presented in almost a documentary format. Because even just trying to explain that to an outsider, and I'm not saying like in a, in a derivative way, but like, it's just an incredible like mindfuck <laughs> to, to even get started on what exactly it means to to be i guess participating or like even even running an arg because to someone else outside of it it doesn't really necessarily have have all the pieces together like when you go to like a movie or like anything else you could say oh it's just a movie oh it's just a whatever but like an arg is a full-on experience that some people get really immersed in w would you say a lot of other people do do what you do necessarily like documenting ARGs and um talking about like i guess internet horror overall or is this something that you've kind of like fell into a specific niche for there were certain people in the scene on youtube um when i arrived who were covering more generally, horrifying stuff you find online. And uh, very few of them were actually bringing things together as they were and presenting them to an audience as this is an alternate reality game or this is an online story that somebody put together using different types of media. Um, quite often it was just, here's some scary shit. <laughs> Isn't it scary? <laughs> Look at how scary it is, guys. Okay, I'll see you back next week. Like and subscribe, and I'll bring you more scary shit I found that I can't talk about because I don't know where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that was a huge problem, especially because a lot of this scary shit that they were finding 
um, was stuff that was part of a story that they were presenting in full context of, this is this totally legitimate, crazy thing I found on the deep web. And I'm over here in the corner raising my hand like, no, that's, uh, that's pure fiction. And it actually came from this totally fictional web series. And I can tell you the whole story behind it. So there were only a few people really even near the field when I got in. There are definitely more now. I love how big the field has gotten. It's really expanded. And uh, <laughs> it's just, it's nuts to see. It's nuts to see the, the fervor that some people have for this and to know that my passion is matched. And I thought it was cool that you could, you could I guess, surmise a lot of that stuff uh, <laughs> in a much more engaging way rather than just like, oh, look at the creepy thing. There's the creepy thing. Let me talk about it. Because like, I guess the, the big thing that preceded your sort of content on uh, YouTube was uh, like people who would do creepypasta readings, but there wasn't necessarily a whole lot of um, weight behind it that, that would really push push it to, to the next level. And I think it's cool that you can put it out there for other people who might be interested in, you know, immersing themselves in that kind of same experience. I guess with your Nightmind persona, because you do like the, the sexy voice and the analytical kind of like idea like is that is that you entirely um this is this is my voice and a lot of people have doubted that it is my voice uh <laughs> sometimes i well no often about just every time i go live or you know do something spontaneous they say oh my god he's not using a program yeah no it's me um <laughs> whenever you are creating uh something though for a video there and and people can probably tell now there is a difference between presentation doing a doing a video nick nocturne and you know speaking generally just being a bit laid back nick nocturne because it's different cadence different tone a uh, little bit more up and down but whenever you make a video you want to create a specific type of air you want to create the atmosphere that you want to pull people into if you had to relate it to something, it's got to be like Rod Serling from um, The Twilight Zone. <laughs> Is There's no way that dude spoke like that all the time. Was it his voice? Yeah. But it would probably thrill people to find conversations he had or interviews he had where he was just laying back, being chill, and slinging words all around. But when you're in that atmosphere where you need to create an experience for somebody, you have to keep in mind your tone, and you have to go ahead and... Uh, be kind of seductive scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it helps, it helps tie it together, and it definitely, like, is good to have a voice specifically in mind for your channel. Because if you just, like, went super generic with it, I don't think it would be nearly as engaging. Yeah, I, I submit to that. Is That's something that I noticed immediately about the horror scene on YouTube. You know, bless people for just going straight up to bat and making content on things that they like, but to me, it was always... God, even in the narration field, even with creepypasta narrators, somebody started a tone, and they started a trend of how to narrate a creepypasta. And just oh. everybody sort of adopted that tone, where everything was kind of scary and hesitant, and a little bit quiet. And that definitely must have bled into the ASMR scene. But it all got so very similar with the creepy music floating behind it that everybody knows by now. And whenever somebody talks like this, you know you're about to hear something horribly contrived. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, it was just, if it wasn't that, it was somebody like, hey guys, what's up? I found this creepy thing online and just, it's super scary, you know? It's just, it's somebody being just plainly a person online and bless them for making content. But for me, it's always been about presentation. Put on a show, create an experience, do the best damn job you can to make something that's going to leave an impact on somebody. Give them goosebumps, if possible, using only your voice. And do it in a way that hasn't been done by literally 12 other people who are narrating creepypastas. <laughs> <laughs> Next week on Dope Talk, more Nick Asmer. <laughs> so... Um, what really got you into this genre, though? Because, like, you, you, you were saying there's a lot of those people who, who are doing this kind of content and talking about it and narrating it. But, like, what, what made you say, I want to make a channel and kind of separate myself from, from that riffraff? It came from seeing a total lack of coverage on Marble Hornets, specifically. Back when I realized that Marble Hornets had wrapped up and there was such a 
giant load of content to go through in order to have a cohesive experience, and even to hear people's feedback on it, really. I looked around and nobody was doing it. Nobody was covering Marble Hornets. Nobody was covering its peers, Everyman Hybrid and Tribe 12. Nobody was covering anything else like that, which I desperately wanted to find. Everybody was doing either top 10 lists of the scariest X you'll find from X, or creepypasta narrations. And it drove me mad. I'm here thinking, here are people who basically suffered to make this stuff, went out there and shot things each and every day on camera, you know, went to these crazy locations, acted on film, put all this effort into it, made these giant sprawling stories, and nobody's talking about it? Nobody's covering it and giving it the kind of attention that you would give to the indie game field when indie game coverage of this kind is huge? It just felt wrong to me. If you want something online, if you want something in the world in general, and nobody else is supplying it, then that's your call to action. If somebody's not doing this, I gotta be the one. So you pick up the mantle, you go forward, and you do the best damn job you can. Because it just, every bit of art in my field, every project, every creator, I felt needs the spotlight that they work towards. They shouldn't just sit in obscurity. If they made good stuff, if they bled over it, if they sweat over it, if they stayed up at night writing over it, hoping that they'll make something that reaches somebody, they deserve to be heard. And it also helps helps these people who've made these projects, like you said, who have put their blood, sweat, and tears into like uh, whatever, like Marble Hornets or, or whatever kind of other spooky stuff. So it's it's cool to see that you're you're enthused about, I guess, bringing more of that to light. You, you see stuff like what Alan Resnick made with Alan Tutorial. And everybody knows it just from that one silly video of a dude trying to drill a hole in a Dr. Pepper can. Or the one with the blue chair. And you know that there's this giant story behind it. That there's... It's art. It's legitimately art. And it's this great, incredible thing. And nobody's talking about it. Nobody's revealing it. And you just feel a call to action of like, you know what? I need to spread this as far and wide as possible. So that everybody understands it. Because if you're creative on any level... Do you understand what it's like to put your blood, sweat, and tears, and heart, and soul, and mind, and everything into a project and get no recognition? Hurts. <laughs> so to have anybody out there who's going to, you know, give you that shoulder to lean on and try and prop you up and yell for a crowd to come over and take a look, that's what everybody wants. So if I can be that person for people, then I absolutely will. So what would you say um, kind of gets your interest in a project uh, that, that you would like to talk about or engage in or maybe analyze for, for your viewers? Like I always look for something that I haven't seen done before. In this field, you've got a constant trend. Somebody makes something very unique, very original, super groundbreaking, grabs all the attention, manages to even gain ground without somebody covering it or talking to other people about it. And then 100 mimics show up to try copying that exact formula so that they can gain the views and the, t the attention, the notoriety, the praise, the whole nine yards. What I'm looking for are the people whose passion is obvious and how much they try to be original and set themselves apart by putting something new, unique, and intelligent out there. You can tell the fakers who are seeking the views and the attention from those who genuinely love what they're doing. You can always tell. <laughs> Usually, it's if whether or not they uh, decided to front load their web series with black and white imagery and dudes in masks who put up signs of binary code. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys <laughs> are seeking attention, or they're not putting in nearly enough effort to qualify. But the ones who really have an idea and whose love for their project and their idea pours over, you always recognize it. They're the ones who stand out immediately. You notice how different they are, even if they're using some similar techniques you've seen. And they always try to tell a story that grips you from the get-go. I mean, I, I guess in that sense, you, you do appreciate someone who, who puts out a project and says, this is, this is something I've kind of put a lot of thought into and, and something I really care about, as opposed to just, hey, here's the fifth version of Jeff the Killer. Yeah, I never, I never want to see... The, the 27th incarnation of To the Ark from Marble Hornets. We're all sick of that. Nobody wants to see it anymore. And, and I, for, for their credit, for anybody who does try and do that, and they are genuinely passionate, and they think that that code stuff is the coolest thing, 
Good on you. You still have my respect. Because you actually, unlike a lot of people, went out there and you made something. You made something with pure intent. It's the ones who do it seeking attention or thinking that they're going to skyrocket just because they copied successful thing from three years ago that I've got no respect for. So like, say for instance, you're, you're doing like the, the research or the video editing. Is there any particular part of that that you're just not excited to get into? Audio. Oh, no. Yeah, because <laughs> I'll go ahead and lay down my audio track. I'll lay down my scripting. And scripting alone, recording alone can take anywhere from an hour to two hours. You get tired. I do it all in one shot. Because if you return to it the next day, I find it's very hard to capture the tone and the feeling that you had before as you were going down the track. And I think in one or two videos where I did give that a shot, you can possibly catch it. But audio will keep me there all day. This is the great oxymoron here. I don't modify my voice, but audio is still the longest process for me. Because I have to go in, I have to clean out all of the dead air space or noises that happen between lines. I have to pace it so that all the lines are flush together. Um, get rid of retakes, lines that I screwed up on. There have been a lot of lines where people would laugh their ass off to hear because I'm going along and I'm saying something really serious about how this video appeared in 2006 and then I go, frig. I, did I just say that? <laughs> no, it kills me because there's a lot of those older creepy pasta people. Like they, when when they did those like recordings and stuff, that you're supposed to be treating it as like they leave it in. Yeah, they, they leave it they in. Do, and like, they like multiple it, takes. And that drove me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it, it kills me it's like just just take a minute like all you have to do is is literally scrub your audio sit there and and take out the bad take and then put it in the part where you fixed it rectified your mistake and just move forward from it like, i don't know how hard that is you're already going to the trouble of recording yourself and like making it sound nice yeah exactly it's like i i pride myself on making the best audio i can so i take ridiculously long with it have you done actual voice acting or like have you ever done any kind of like voice work for other projects? No, never. Yeah, every everything that I've done for Nightmind has been entirely self-taught. I've got no real experience to speak of prior to it for working on anything. Um, I did like to read out loud a lot, you know, in past moments of anybody reading out loud. And I always like to take words and give them the best shot that I can. I've always admired people on the radio. Because their entire presence is their voice. And they have to speak between songs. They have to speak between music. Where people with the most golden and, you know, skilled voices, the most trained sounds possible that can be made with a throat, are present all the time. They've got to be the bridge between that. So if they can carry that weight, then they keep you in the experience. And I've always admired them. I've definitely got a lot of being raised listening to the radio and admiring the way that people treat their airtime between songs. And just in general, when people read out loud, it's like, why not give it the best shot you can? So I've always been, you know, into that whenever the shot arises. But no, Nine Mind is definitely my first experience doing anything with my voice uh, professionally or with the programs and skills that I've used online. And would you say you've seen like a huge rise in the, the quality of your, uh, I guess, recording and, and video editing and all that between then and now? Oh my god, yes. <laughs> because on the Alan tutorial video, on the Alan tutorial video, the one complaint that I got throughout the comment section was, why is the audio from the actual videos he pulled in louder than any of your narration? And I thought, is it really? What did I do wrong? So I go into it and I, I'm exploring it. And I'm like, oh, so the program actually doesn't recognize that this is naturally louder than my narration track. So I have to manually set everything to this certain thing whenever I pull in video. It's just setting yourself up. I mean, like, I think that's the cool part about making content on YouTube or even just any other, like, you know, big social media site is like when you're self-produced, you learn stuff over time. And if you have the passion and energy to, to, to put into learning, these things that that really sets you apart from like all the other people like just just willing to to throw down like some shit tier audio or shit tier editing to just to try to get a video out or something not that there's anything wrong with with putting stuff out at a, at a lower level but it definitely helps that you learn over time and i think that's incredibly encouraging for new content creators yeah i i never ever want to put out a video where i know it was less than the best job i could do 
There, there are cases where I had ideas for things that I wanted to do with videos or things that I could add in where I just did not get the opportunity or I did not have the time or the means. And that stuff, you gotta let go. But stuff that you're capable of fixing, it's like, I can't not do it. If I hear a sound in my audio as I'm editing that I know is some background click and it's ugly and that probably nobody else is going to notice it, I noticed it and that's enough for me. I got to go in, I got to delete it, I got to clean up the track. Yes, I'm going to be sitting here for eight hours fixing this 15 minute track here, but you know what? It's going to be worth it. I have to. <laughs> when you find a project that you really want to work on, and you sit down with it, like, how, how long does it take you typically to do the research for these things? Because I know you're probably spending hours and upon hours just digging through forums and, like, whatever else that kind of is part of the experience. It definitely varies depending on the kind of project. Sometimes I get lucky and everything that's involved with it is straight on YouTube. You can find all the evidence there. Other times, you do have to dig around and collect the pieces and some projects are just so huge and long and, and shambling that you, you're going to spend um, at least two days doing that. My process usually is when I find something, I try to judge how many pieces are attached to it and go through it according to the timeline. Uh, for really long stuff, <laughs> like Everyman Hybrid, it can take you about three to four days, legitimately. Um, especially with stuff like Marble Hornets too. For stuff that's like uh, the recent thing I just did, the human pet, you can knock that down in a, in a day, easy. You know, it's just an afternoon worth of watching the videos, finding the extra videos, pulling all the content pieces together and realizing, okay, here's the story, here's what I actually need to tell about it, here are the references that I need to pull for it, and present everything so that the audience understands what happened without going into the tiny little trivial parts of it. I think I've gotten better at trimming the trivial stuff that I would have definitely included in my, you know, perfectionist nature back in the day when I was doing Marble Hornets and Everyman Hybrid and all that. I felt like, no, every single step must be recorded. <laughs> Even if it's just a stupid code that means literally something that I just explained, it has to be in there. I've since learned, no, nah, not really. <laughs> I've noticed with a lot of the newer YouTube content creators, especially the ones I've been interviewing recently, it's it's kind of a trend to do these longer winded formats with like hour long episodes. And some people even get into the two hour episodes. But I think I think generally that's kind of the sweet spot. Would, would you say it's it's because you want to get thorough with with your kind of work? Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, my my trait with video lengths is that I'm thinking, okay, this can make a nice 20, 30 minute video at the longest. I go and I write the script and I make sure to trim the fat as much as possible. And then I lean back and say, oh, oh, this is going to actually be 45 minutes before I put the video segments in here that will result in it being a 58 minute video. Well, I guess it happened again, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I never want to make ridiculously long videos. I want to make a video that nails exactly what needs to be done in the shortest amount of time that is necessary for it to have a really solid, thorough, and good experience. I'm not trying to game the algorithm or keep people there forever. This is just a natural curse of mine. <laughs> this is just how things happen. And I can't not, you know, make them that long because it just, I've got to include everything that I've got to include. And that includes um, the scripting process is I'm going along and I'm seeing the page count go up and up and up. And I'm like, oh, no, it's going to reach this point, isn't it? And then I just got to sigh and say, OK, whatever. I'll fix it at the end if I can. I'll chop out whatever little superfluous stuff is in there. But for the most part, I just got to roll with it. It's how this usually happens. The audience is used to it and they like it anyway. So <laughs> I got a deal. The longer formats, though, like I'm guessing it takes a lot longer for you to set up these videos. Do you ever feel like pressure to like keep putting out videos on a frequent basis or is, is that not an issue for you? I wish I could. Um, with me, there, there's quite often that I decide on a topic as I look into it. Um, my process for finding stuff, uh, when it actually comes to investigating the leads that I do get, I like to poke around a little bit, check 
each lead by watching a few videos or looking at a few posts involved in the storyline, and then judge from there whether or not something's going to be worth it. If I make the judgment call, this is what comes next, then during the researching phase, I might suddenly stumble along something that leads to a whole nother branch of the story, and then the time just goes right up through the roof. So quite often I find that something I judge to be about maybe a half hour video because of this amount of content is actually going to be maybe twice as long. It's, it's rough sometimes. You, you get surprised like um, the Wyoming incident, <laughs> for example. <laughs> oh boy. You've done a few videos on that, right? Yeah, I, I've done two because it actually resurfaced. But the first video, I thought that was going to be an open and shut case of here are the creepy videos. Here's some of the stuff on the um, forum for it. Go through it. Go through the timeline. And then as you're in the middle of it, you realize, oh, oh, God, they're extending the story. And now they're really extending the story. And the story is going up, up. It's going higher. It's reaching past the clouds. It's going near that plane. And then you and then you're like in it for the entire duration when you thought it was just going to be about half the length it turned out to be. So you get surprised sometimes. That's gotta be a good feeling to to be able to say, Hey, I actually am ahead of you guys for once. I don't have to worry about like what's this new internet phenomena. I I like when you can lead cases though in, in some in some cases to to help like further further that that uh cause that other people are interested in um t- i guess i guess that kind of brings me into like dealing with the community though like i guess you see a lot of interaction from these arg communities and people who are like horror enthusiasts would you say it's mostly a positive experience talking to them or can can it get a little like wild oh my god yeah um the community I say it all the time. I'm probably a broken record at this point with anybody who follows me, but the community is the only reason that I have the success that I have. It's the only reason that I am here at at this station in my life and have been blessed with everything that's come to me. I can never not appreciate and thank them at any given opportunity and let them know how much I do love them. You're you're nothing on, on the internet without your fan base without the people who support you and appreciate you. You can try as you might, but it's only because of the people who respond to what you put out that you get anywhere. And talking to them is a wonderful experience. And a lot of the time, they're very much on the same page as me, even when they're sending jokes to me. Um, <laughs> they, they know my humor. They know my limits for certain kinds of humor. And they'll go ahead and push them, and I'll push back, and we'll just have a good time. But they are the most patient and understanding people. They are very keen. They are very kind. Again, I'd be nowhere without them. So every experience with with viewers is wonderful. I seldom have a bad experience. You'd think with horror that you would get a lot of freaky or creepy people. And I've had two or three at the worst. That's it. So everybody else is pretty much golden. It's like 99% on top of things. Perfect. Art's always been kind of a mixed bag, but at least doing art for the last two or three years, it's been very positive, and I'm so incredibly happy to to deal with all these uh, wonderful motherfuckers. <laughs> you know? It's it's great. 10 out of 10. I really appreciate it when you guys, like anybody who's even listening right now, it's it's just cool to see that kind of enthusiasm surrounding like work because it makes it like that much more like i'm i'm happy with what i'm doing because other people are enjoying it and you know you you become you oh. become a natural performer in that you only feel good putting on the performance when the audience is there digging it as well it's just kind of that sort of deal and it's very interesting to see do you, do you get that yourself sometimes Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, community management just in general, like I think that's a skill you you gain from interacting with people on such a large scale. I mean, I've I've been doing it for like the last what, 5 10 years so far. <laughs> like I've I've interacted with with a lot of uh, I would say viewers, fans and whatever else. And that can be incredibly liberating and it's also incredibly stressful because when you put yourself out there in front of a bunch of people that that you might not necessarily know on an individual level it's it's hard because you have to really put your best self out there you know (laughs) and there will be moments where you slip up i think and there those are the defining moments whether or not you you change based on you know how how you interact with people and you figure out what works and what doesn't that that's i think the the true test of character right there for any content creator 
Yeah, you always want to be your best for people. You never want to let them down. That's definitely an aspect of, you know, community involvement that you think about a lot. And <laughs> kind of why some people who are strictly online usually say stay strictly online is because in any instance of interaction with a viewer, you or a consumer of anything you make, you never want to let them down. Ever. You want to be your best self. I think my first experience doing that, at least, like, um, on a, on a weirder scale was, like, when I was selling my art at a convention not, not too long ago. And that, when I sat down and, and people, like, were, were coming up to me like, oh, I love what you're, you're doing with your art or your podcast. And, like, hearing that many people say it, like, in person and look at you and smile and say they, they legitimately enjoy your content, that's mind-blowing to me. And to have that kind of experience anywhere, even if it's just one person, that's, like, whoa, you know? I don't know. I really do appreciate uh, interacting with with uh, stellar communities, though, and I, I'm very grateful for the uh, people I've I've been able to interact with thus far. Uh, so, I was I was gonna ask about your collaboration with with other creators, and this is kind of I guess what we were talking about earlier. But um, I see you talking to Nix online. I see you talking to a lot of other people. Would you say that you you like you know um, collaborating in videos and other stuff like that on a regular basis or is that kind of like an every now and then thing for you um I definitely enjoy collaboration it, it's certainly um, an every now and then thing because some I just have so much content that I know I've got to go through I've always got an eternal backlog there's always a list so one of the running gags with me is I'll put it on the list because <laughs> there's definitely a list. There's a backlog for sure of all the stuff that I gotta do. That would be purely Night Mind's Nick Nocturne covers this kind of deal, where I couldn't really find somebody else to pull in on it if I tried. But certain topics where you know you share common ground with somebody who's really cool, who you admire, who you're friendly with, I love pulling them in. Like with, with Nick's fears, I go way back with May. Uh, we go way back to the beginning of um, my career on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> starting with... Something truly silly, which was a teardown review of A Christmas Horror Story, this just awful <laughs> Christmas-based anthology horror, horror film. And from there, we just kept collaborating. And uh, we find certain topics that we love to jump in on, and it's almost like our communities have become sibling communities. There's a lot of crossover, and I love that. And th the same goes with other people that I've collaborated with. I just love to prop people up and, you know, help them get forward and give them any kind of exposure that I can and just celebrate things with them. You know, just two people who love something, celebrating something they both enjoy and just being geeks about it online. Because <laughs> you need that kind of familiarity with, with anybody you're going to work with, especially if you want to make something good. Because, I mean, hands down, any project I've had to collaborate with, I've always, I've always done my best when I've had, like, somebody who's on the same page as me and 100%. It's, I'm, I never look for people to collaborate with saying, oh, they're bigger than me, or oh, they do this special kind of thing, I'd love to be involved with them. It's strictly, I like them, I really like what they do, we share common ground, I would love to have a bunch of positive things come out of me being with them and them being with me and vice versa. You know, it's just natural friendship sort of deal. Um, we could actually bring it to the Q&A section, uh, it, which, which we got through a lot of stuff. So thank you for, for bearing with me so far. I really appreciate all these, these great answers. Cool. So um, I, guess, I guess to start with, uh, we, got, we got somebody named Fern who's asking, what inspired the design of your character and why does he have four eyes? Okay, so the story goes like this. When I decided to open the Nightmind channel, I had no idea who or what I was as a character, as an idea. I knew that I wanted it to be more than just me being Nick Nocturne, host of Nightmind. I am infinitely more involved in creativity than that, and I, and I want things to be as creative and cool and immersive as possible. I decided the best way to go about it would be to leave it up to the community. My supporters, who create the success of Nightmind or any notoriety it has, should dictate what I am. So, during the first Halloween, the first October, um, of the channel, back in 2015, somebody asked me precisely about that, of what exactly I was. I decided, because it was October and Hocus Pocus, the Disney movie, was on my brain constantly, <laughs> to respond <laughs> by love saying, yup, me too, it's a, it's a golden classic, I decided to say, I am secretly 
a 16th century boy cursed into the form of an immortal black cat or or something like that basically between the lines saying yeah i'm thackeray banks from hocus pocus <laughs> so somebody decided to take that response and submit a doodle of me being exactly that but they also added two more eyes and i loved it so much i had such a good laugh about it and i enjoyed it so much that i basically reblogged it everywhere and then i got this really awesome piece of art from an artist who's made depictions of me constantly uh, as a shark um sometimes goes by fox as well on twitter who submitted this design of uh, me like full anthro with four arms and four eyes sitting at a desk um, do, doing the night mine thing. And I loved it. It was just full color. It was full detail. I just, I fell in love with the idea instantly. And then the fan art started to pour in in spades with that exact depiction. And from, and because of all the ways <laughs> in which I was depicted as the house cat size, as the full anthropomorphic furry size, with two arms, with four arms, with different colors for eyes. I thought, well, what would make sense for all of these different depictions? I'm a shapeshifter. And that just really spoke to me. Not only am I otherworldly, I'm a shapeshifter, which is why I'm able to actually do this and, if need be, move about in the human world without being detected or freaking people out. You know? <laughs> so I said, yeah, this is it. Yep. Yeah. So that's what I settled on, is the, the community took to it even more than I did quite immediately, and I loved it, I celebrated it, and I lifted it right up. Beautiful. That's actually a very, very great response. Um, so Skulls has asked, can you share big inspirations that you haven't already told your fans about, maybe? Definitely my friend Riser from the Webcomic Relief. Riser was one of the people on YouTube who basically let me know, just by watching him, you can do the sort of thing that I was thinking about doing, and you could succeed at it. And it was good. Riser covers webcomics, and he covers good stuff that he can applaud endlessly. He covers awful, terrible shit <laughs> that everybody can get a laugh at and cringe at. And he does it often in a comedic way, but he also does it in a highly intelligent, fully passionate, and understanding way. And he was one of my main motivations to begin this work, because he was doing precisely what I was thinking about, taking something undiscovered or in a niche sort of field, pushing it forward, talking about it. So, Riser, for sure. Um, one of my other inspirations, I would say, and he definitely doesn't know about this, I hate everything. Alex and I hate everything for sure. Because whenever I watch... Yeah, he is great. Because whenever I watch one of his videos, I think, damn, he's the same thing as me here. He is a faceless voice on the internet. All he's got is his visual representation that he chooses. And yet, every single time, he's kicking my ass in the animation and graphics department, and it just... Urgh, he's so good, I gotta get better. I gotta meet Alex's level. I get the same effect, too, with watching Pan Pizza of Rebel Taxi. Uh, Pan is a friend. He's, he's uh, had me on his podcast, and we've chatted back and forth. Yeah, exactly. No, that's that's a huge part of why I'm sticking with the whole podcast series on YouTube. It's just like I'm meeting all these cool motherfuckers and I'm like, damn, I need to step my game up. <laughs> so, Succulent Rat has asked, do you ever find it inconvenient only doing horror-based content? It seems difficult nowadays with the scarcity of content, appreciation, and experimentation. Actually, yeah. I love keeping that mind as pure dark content and mysterious stuff. I'm able to branch out a little bit, depending on what it is, because, uh, you know, sometimes stuff falls within the edges of my field based on its formatting or what's involved in it, and I can go ahead and cover it, like stuff like Lasagna Cat. Lasagna Cat, if it didn't have the ending that it did, I may not have been able to even touch that thing. If I... I, I would have strictly, definitely had to open the Cabin Fever Dreams idea for that where I branch out into this really weird, surreal thing that's mostly humor-based. But sometimes it's, it's tough, because you do want to talk about things that are really cool or that you really enjoy, but you know it won't fit the content. Um, and for that, I just... <laughs> I enjoy watching other people talk about it. Like uh, Mr. Matty Plays on YouTube. He's a friend of mine as well. I've been on his podcast. And he covers a lot of Fallout 4 stuff. He covers a lot of Bethesda stuff in general. Um, some other video game things. And it just it feels good to watch 
and get his perspective on things and have that open video discussion about topics that I would have felt compelled to cover myself if I'd been able. Because my brain is always active. <laughs> I'm always thinking about stuff and tearing it apart and analyzing it and thinking. But only, only some of it can apply to Night Mind. And I'm cool with that. I don't really need to open a second channel because <laughs> I'm busy enough as it is, man. <laughs> I'm busy enough as it is. I overworked this brain too much already. Would you ever consider, like, trying to open up new content, though, on your channel? Possibly. I definitely have to figure out the angle for it, but, um, I, I could, potentially. I never want to stop innovating. I'm innovating all the time. It would just be an act of really thinking it through. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely something. I mean, like, I at least for me, I've noticed a lot of content creators who, who uh, branch out into different forms of, of stuff, like, I guess... Even if it's, like, somebody who does, like, a lot of video game reviews, I've noticed some people can get away with doing, like, food reviews or whatever else if they have the right kind of personality to carry it. <laughs> Pew Pew 900, interesting name, uh, has asked, what is your favorite horror web series that you've analyzed? Oh, my God. Hands down, don't hug me, I'm scared. Even though it was also the absolute worst, it was the best. Um, because that was an experience and a half that took so much effort and so much labor and so much stress and so many headaches and so much time. But God, was it worth it? Because I knew what I was building was something that nobody else had actually done and that somebody else would have to be even crazier than me to try. Me, I already know how crazy I am. <laughs> I expect this stuff of myself. But I, I felt... This is going to be completely worth it. It's nuts, but it's worth it. Would, would you say, have you actually ever interacted with any of the people who've run these projects? I never reach out while I'm working on an investigation or video. Um, I have often had them uh, speak to me after I've released a video and have them said hello. And it's, it's excellent to see. It happens more often than people think, honestly. I get a lot of people who have contacted me. Um, there are some things I've done for Night Vision where I now know exactly who made it because they've reached out. And it's just cool to have a line with them and see what they're developing for the next piece of it. I've had people uh, reach out behind uh, some of the case files that I have. I know who some of these people are now. And it's amazing to see who is exactly behind the curtain and know the details of the project and its stage as it's happening and know what they might be working on now or what they're doing for it. And Wham City Comedy, I, I think it's obvious to everybody, I have a really good relationship with those guys. Um, they reached out to me back after uh, the release of my coverage of This House's People in it, and I've been talking to them ever since. They don't tell me about what they're going to do, and I completely like to keep it that way. It's always a game of, okay, Wham City's working on this now. Oh boy, what is it? And then they release it, and it's like they're all they're peeking behind the corner, looking at me while I'm staring at them. <laughs> and we both know that a video is coming. So what are we gonna say? We have the best um kind of weird business friendship, I'd say, ever. <laughs> it's really cool. So Humboldt Squid has asked what is the most common weakness you find in horror web series uh i guess i guess like what would you say is, is the most common weakness that most of these things fall victim to writing and production wise the number one failure of most things that i see are they are trying to be creepy or scary or freaky without understanding why the thing that they're imitating was creepy or scary or freaky in the first place it's a lot like singing lyrics to a song but having no idea what they mean. Uh, so often, people will take certain aspects of web series that were really impactful and try to imitate them, but they're not accounting for the timeline of events that led up to that moment, the emotional buildup of characters behind it, your manipulation of the viewer behind the screen, priming them for the moment that you attack with the thing that you're using, the context of it, the way that you present it in the first place. It's... Monkey see, monkey do, but monkey doesn't understand why they felt compelled to do that and why that little dance works on other monkeys. <laughs> and I think that's why we get so many other code makers or binary code guys or dudes in masks. It worked in Marble Hornets and other series for a reason. It worked because they laid the foundation for it. 
it's not going to work for you at the very offset of you just shoving it in somebody's face because you didn't pay attention to how it was done first. You didn't put down the road. You can't stick a toll bridge on, you know, a back road <laughs> and have it be successful and make you money. You need to stick it on a highway that people have already gone one mile up and they're trapped and they have to go through the toll now because there is no exit. You have to do, you have to lay the foundation. You have to understand why you're putting in the thing that you're putting in. All people seem to get is the impact that it had on them. They don't understand the why and how of it though. If they took the time to analyze it and study it and figure out why did this scene strike me as hard as it did, they would be able to reproduce it in a unique, original, new way and have it work. It, it's, the, it's the essence behind that line that people say all the time. Give me the same thing, but different. Yeah, well, if you're going to take inspiration from something, you need to be able to break it down into the elements that make it and why those elements work so you can build your own vocabulary for a story. I mean, like, whenever people ask me personally for for how how to how to take inspiration from other things whatever because i'm an artist so a lot of people are like how do you build your own style do you copy from someone else directly it's like no i take a lot of the uh ideas and and things that i see that i like and i and i break those down into bits and pieces and i kind of put them back together in a way that makes sense to me i don't just take like the whole the whole segment i i chop like an arm off of something and i i put it on my myself like no it's it's a whole process yeah you you it's take whole... the arm and you and you open it up and you ask yourself why does this arm work the way it does you analyze the bone structure the muscles you see how it works moving it back and forth and you say okay now I know how to build my own arm. Yeah, it's it's like it, you gotta analyze. You have to you have to appreciate um, what what goes into that process, and that's how you build your own vocabulary and your own voice. And you know, there's some people I think who are naturally better at at uh, storytelling or like uh, art or whatever else, and that's cool. But that doesn't mean that you can't find things that that work for you, and that doesn't mean that you if you haven't found your voice immediately, it's it's not a bad thing. Like you 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 can build that over time. It just you need to not immediately try to copy what's popular or what's successful or whatever works. Like you know, in in a sense where you're immediately expecting some sort of monetary or like you know whatever bonus from having having copied. You know. Yeah. Exactly. And I find a lot of people who do precisely that. They, they copy, expecting the views, expecting the attention, expecting the impact. Mm, no. No, man. You, would, you wouldn't have your don't hug me as I'm scared. You wouldn't have your this house has people in it. You wouldn't have that kind of shit. You know? <laughs> they, don't, they don't just put it together and say, wow, this is going to be popular. They just do it based on a whim of, of, wow, this is something I really care about and I want to do this because I have a fucking vision. That, that's, that's the whole focus right there, the vision. Um... So, so moving on to Party Boy, what a great name, for, for someone with a limited internet presence, this is actually kind of related, I'm, I'm smart that I put this together like this, uh, for, for someone with a limited internet presence, what's the best way to go about cultivating a following for a web series? As a young artist, I'm really apprehensive about putting my work out there because I have like no followers and most social media accounts, but I see plenty of incredibly obscure web series getting, getting like some sort of foundation or following. Okay, so this is a twofold sort of deal. And it is an excellent question because it is the great mystery beyond how do I make the thing. Because you can make the thing, you can be confident in the thing, you can know that you did your job. But how the hell are people going to find it? <laughs> you did the quality stuff, now how do you get the audience? So, twofold. The first is all about knowing the format that you're pushing stuff out on. Each website is different in getting people to absorb what you put out and circulate. Kind of different rules for Tumblr, different rules for Twitter, different rules for YouTube. YouTube specifically is about titles and thumbnails. The two things that catch people no matter what, because that's the cover of your book. People say don't judge a book by its cover, but books have covers for reasons. It's the invitation. It's what gets people to pick it up and take a look inside. It, we have the same thing for pretty much everything. God, hey, even, even down to food. You know, you make the most appetizing wrapper you can, and then you lure people in. You get them to take a bite. One moment, my cat is screaming. <laughs> yeah. Your cat. 
Yeah, my son. <laughs> I heard. <laughs> and uh, his cat. name is in honor of uh, Hocus Pocus and the entire start of my uh, persona slash what people would call fursona online, Binks. <laughs> Going back to the topic, though, uh, you really got to know how to present your content on YouTube in a way that is going to appeal to you. Because if it would lure you in, it's going to lure other people in. And you've really just got to let it take traction from there. The very fact that Super Obscure started from nowhere, point zero web series are gaining traction and becoming giants out of nowhere is proof that this process works. People love to share. Our entire community loves to share what they find. Our entire community is constantly on the hunt for new stuff. Because me, I'm good at digging up a lot of new stuff after people find the lead and pass it on to me. Because I'm always busy making the next video on something. Either something that's been dead for 10 years or more, like the human pet, or something that's on my radar now that's been big for a while. Or God knows whatever I'm doing at the time. But meanwhile, stuff gains traction. Pets Cop. Perfect example. Pets Cop lands in the middle of nowhere on YouTube, right? No traction outside of it, just the video. And yet, it picks up notice. Why does it pick up notice? Let's do a quick example here. I'm actually going to go over into my other monitor here and pull up the Petscop channel just so that we can take a look. You know, I was actually going to bring up Petscop because um, it was interesting. This, this kind of brings my own point in about persistence is that Petscop, I think, posted several videos. They just kept going with it until it picked up. <laughs> Oh yeah, of course. So, immediately uploading Petscom's YouTube channel here, taking a look at what they've got going on. All the way back to 11 months ago when they released their first video. The first video is 9 minutes long, 8 seconds. It's called Purely Petscop. The thumbnail that you see is from, obviously, what looks like an old PlayStation game, PlayStation 1. And it says caught in the middle of it. It's vibrant, it's colorful. It's a screenshot of something that we have not seen, but it's eye-catching and somehow familiar. It lets us know so much in a single shot that it's probably a video game. It's probably a very old video game. You've never heard of it, but you want to know more just to take a look, just to see if it jogs your memory a little bit. There is a curiosity factor from the faceplate alone between that title and the thumbnail. And then we have it all the way through for every single video upload. You have to entice people with your front presentation first because that's how YouTube works. Something catches our eye, either in the title or the video thumbnail, and it manages to get past the filter of, oh, this looks stupid, or oh, this looks like bullshit, or oh, this looks like somebody trying to accomplish this task. And then it brings us in. It's all about the act of the initial presentation. And then when you get them in the door and you hit them with the content, then you hook them. <laughs> that's that's great, though. I mean, like, I know there's a lot of content creators that like to explain that within, like, the first 10, 15 seconds, that's, like, when you hit them with the, with the sweet YouTube facts. But that's, that's genuinely a, a great way of looking at it because you do want to be able to say a lot about your content. Exactly. You can find it in my own video titles and thumbnails. Art, in general, is an act of seduction. You've got to lay the bait first and invite them in. Then you hit them with the stuff that keeps them with you. So, I guess, I guess moving on to our last situation over here is, I guess, closing out the podcast. And this is, this is uh, if there's anything, I guess, you wanted to say before, before you closed off, um, maybe to your viewership or, or the people uh, who, who might be watching. Well, I did mention earlier how much I love everybody here. <laughs> um... You know, and it's just the only reason I have any success on YouTube is because of them. And I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be here with you, Coca. Uh, I love all of Coca's fan base, too. And what you guys are about. Everything's gone. Everything's great. Everything's awesome. And I just, you know, I've been blessed. I've definitely been blessed. Just, just, <laughs> all that stuff blows my mind. I'm like, what? <laughs> what is this? But no, it's it's cool that you're an incredibly grateful based person about that. That, that that's always encouraging to see from content creators when they can get down on a more personal level. Um, is is there any like projects or stuff that you wanted to talk about maybe before you like hopped off or, or yeah, or are you all set up? 
Um, I definitely have the idea for my next video set up, and now that I'm done doing the big, uh, workflow that was involved with creating, um, a new visual aspect of the Nightmon channel, I can go ahead and make videos more regularly now, which is fantastic, because, ooh boy, did that take some time. <laughs> you know, I gotta, I gotta just, for like, maybe four or five months solid, just make videos on topics and not try to do this big elaborate crazy thing that's gonna take a month of working on it while everybody wonders where i went and what i'm doing and then come back and then they're all relieved like oh okay he wasn't slacking off and being lazy while he sat on his patreon money he was actually making something yeah that happens <laughs> i think as long as you keep in contact yeah. with your uh with your patrons um that, that that makes it a lot easier yeah it definitely does so no i know exactly what i'm doing next for about the uh the next two videos videos for sure definitely for the next one and i'm gonna get started on that real soon hello fam all right um with that i guess i'm closing out the podcast but it's been great having nick on it's also been great uh doing doing this uh, <laughs> i guess i could say this this whole podcast has been live but it's cool it's it's a really interesting gratifying experience and i'm really glad to have had mr nocturne on uh do you want to say bye uh, yep, I will say bye, and also that uh, something funny I just got from the live stream. Haven't had too many questions come in from there, but this is funny. Just somebody in all capitals goes, Everybody support Nick's Patreon so he gets that goal of making him wear a fursuit. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Obviously, the whole episode. obviously, I get questions. I get, I get questions all the time about uh, me and possibility of being mixed in with the furry crowd. As, as for obvious reasons and i finally caved in on patreon and i put at like a forty five hundred dollar a month goal for two months i think i said you finally broke me furries and i said if you reach this goal and you keep it for two months i will commission an actual nick nocturne fursuit and i put it at forty five hundred because i think that's so lofty they'll never reach it They'll never reach yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> but but it's just daring enough to, to put it it's up. Daring. Oh, man, people yeah. are plugging the patch. Please do that. I want to see Nick Nocturne <laughs> for a suit at possible possible events in the future. Wink wink nudge nudge. All right, guys. With that, dope talks out. Thanks for hanging out. It's been it's been a good old time. Absolutely. Thank you, Coca, and thank you, everybody. Well, if it isn't my favorite group of hooligans, the viewers. <laughs> I got a few cool things to talk about today. First thing is always, um, I'm actually sponsored by Audible. They have over something like 180,000 books they can give to you. And I got a link below that you can click on. You can go get yourself a free trial and a free good old book. This week I would recommend uh, John Green's Looking for Alaska. It's a book about some young punks who get into some tough shit at boarding school. It's got themes of love, romance, death. <laughs> if you like the kind of shit that I write about, then you, you would definitely enjoy it yourself. But yeah, guys, you want to support me as cool authors. There you go. And the most exciting thing is that me, Jib Cody, and Nick Nocturne are all going to be hosting for an event called Furpocalypse later this year. It's a Halloween-themed furcon, and boy howdy do we have some spooky stuff planned for you. you got the fucking spook master himself, like New Age Vincent Price going in there. What the fuck? So if you want a chance to maybe meet us in person, get to see a live Dope Talk panel, get to see uh, Nick talk about his content, he might actually be doing some panels too. Jib, I don't know. <laughs> He's cool. I don't know if you've ever seen him in, in suit, but boy, he gets... He gets going. Yeah, if you want to go, it's later this year in October. I'll leave a link down below, but it's it's a smack dab in Cromwell, Connecticut. Couldn't find a more beautiful place to hang out in the middle of fall, you know? I would highly recommend if you want to have a good time. Last but not least, I'm trying to make my content more uh, regular, I would say. So I'm going to have a new BTD out next week, which, boy howdy, that's going to be a big topic. Um, on top of that, I'm trying to do, I think, two episodes a month to keep it on uh, more, like, regular posting. Because now I have more guests coming on, and I have more, like, shit that I want to do with it. But, yeah, expect more content more frequently. It'll, it'll be cool. And as always, special thanks to Lucky and Tater. You guys are fucking rocking it. And all the other people who support this show, you're lovely. Just saying. So as always, thanks for stopping by, and I hope you have a stellar time. Hey, guys. I'm totally a furry. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>